So a question you didn't ask yourself this morning. Which covenant do you live by, the new or the old? No, didn't ask yourself that, did you? Well, that's not very theological of you. Or perhaps in keeping with the passage uh, here from Cana in Galilee, the, other, the question might be, do you wash in water or do you drink the wine? I'm going to explore what that means. What it means to think about the old covenant, the new covenant, and kind of which one do we actually really live in? Because we might not have thought about that. What is a covenant, covenant though, I hear you ask? Philip, you can't ask me that question if I don't understand the question. That's a bit like watching a university challenge, where you feel like uh, if you want, even understand the question, you, you've won. Let me ask, answer the, what the, what's the question asking? Covenant, you might have heard the word in relation to land or the use of buildings and that kind of thing. People put covenants on land, don't they, quite often? Say it must be used like this or for this only, like in a church usually. But a covenant is a very old norm of how the biblical writers captured how God is acting in the world towards people. It's his agreement, arrangement, perhaps a contract, you might call it as well. Um, and for those of us with good brethren heritage, I'm starting to talk about dispensationalism. Oh, dear. Don't get too excited. I'm not going too far into that. Um, but it's about how God disposes himself to relate to the world and us to relate to God. So, to our question, which covenant do you live by and how do you know? Let's give a little flavour of what the Jewish covenant looked like. Well, the Jews were a chosen people. God chose them. Uh, and they were given law. Big old book of it. Lots of stipulations. They were told to keep the law. But if they did sin, they had ways of giving sacrifices. Usually a, an animal. And they had different festivals. And they'd have to go to the uh, temple and sacrifice an animal for their forgiveness. Worship was, broadly speaking, ceremonial and cultural. So they'd have big parties like three times a year for a week at a time. And they'd also go to the temple for different things. So that's a broad flavour of the Jewish covenant, if you like, of how God was relating to Israel. But then you had this Jesus thing happened. The new covenant, the new arrangement. And yes, we still talk about chosen people, the chosen of God being Christians. But instead of sacrificing animals, we've got Christ as our forgiveness. Uh, and instead of wor worshipping through ceremony and animal sacrifice, we, as John describes it, we worship by the Spirit. And instead of law, actually what we've got is we follow Christ in love. So quite different ways of being are described in that. And this passage we've just read uh, about the wedding in Cana in Galilee isn't, I'm sorry to say, about God liking a party or God approving of marriage. It's actually a kind of metaphorical reflection on the difference between that old covenant, that old relationship, and the new covenant and new relationship that God has for us now, which is why I ask the question, do you wash in water or do you drink the wine? And I think it's quite easy as Christians to get stuck in what the old covenant is, because we learned the law and we've got to be good and all of that stuff. And actually we miss the wine, the fullness of life and light and healing and joy that actually God's got for us. So I'm going to ask you three questions to explore that question with you. Three questions. Number one, do you go to the temple or are you the temple? Number two, do you follow the word or do you follow the Lord? Number three, what's your name and who named you? And to explore that, we're going to have to go into the prologue to this little story of the wedding in Cana in chapter 1, which asks us some interesting questions about this new covenant. So, do you go to the temple or are you the temple? Chapter 1, 
verses, verse 33. John the Baptist says, I didn't know him, speaking of Jesus, but he sent me to baptise with water. And he, he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. You've probably heard that phrase before. It's written deeply through uh, the book of Acts, which is the account of how God happens in the early church. What do we mean by baptised in the Holy Spirit? Well, remember I mentioned that actually the form of worship was ceremonial and was at the temple, which is where God dwelled in Israel. Well, the idea changes as you get into the later prophets talking about how this new covenant arrangement is going to be. And it's described very neatly in the book of Joel, quoted by St. Peter in Acts chapter 2. He says, in those last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men, old men shall dream dreams. And what you're seeing changing in that, is back in the Old Covenant, what happened is the prophets would have the Spirit of God on them, occasionally, not all the time. What has been described in Joel, that has been described through St. Peter, is that that Spirit of God is being thrown out there willy-nilly. So any old soul, children, parents, grandparents, women even, could have the Spirit of God. My goodness, how radical is that? And what you see in the book of Acts is this real distinction the way it was asked. Of, well, people have had the baptism of John, but have you had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is the question that's asked. And, uh, well, if you have, you know it. Because this is the direct intervention of God connecting with you and me and being alive in you and me and through you and me. So, hence... We don't have to go to the temple. When we have the Holy Spirit, well, we are the temple. God dwelling in us, through us, in our communities. So second question, do you follow the word or do you follow the Lord? It's a little clue to what I'm talking about here in chapter 1, verse 39. Where are uh, all these new disciples say to Jesus, where do you live? And Jesus says, Come and you will see. Come and you will see. It's a little clue for us to reflect on how this works. But actually we don't understand God through the word. No, it's helpful. It's helpful. Really what fundamentally is said is when you come and follow Jesus, when you treat him as Lord, then you start to see what it's all about. So instead of being receiving it because somebody's told you, again back to the idea of Joel, you get to understand God because God tells you by his Holy Spirit. Third question, what's your name and who named you? In chapter 1 verse 42, it's, it says, this is uh, Simon meeting Jesus. Jesus says to him, you're Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter or Little Rock. It's an interesting thing in the Old Testament particularly, and here we see it again in the relationship between Jesus and Peter. The issue of who names you is a matter of both the authority of the one naming, that they have the power to name who you are, and also the purpose of the one named. Do you remember Abraham? Abraham became Abraham when God met him because he was saying, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. It was about naming and purpose. It's not simply about, oh, I fancy calling you something else. And this is what you see with Peter. Peter, who we see in the Gospels, is a bit of a, an idiot and a drip and occasionally gets it really right and more often gets it really wrong. This weak, kind of rather wet, vacillating chap actually ends up being what Jesus names him. I'm calling you Peter, the rock on which I will build my church. And he does. 
So Peter is the guy who's preaching in Acts chapter 2 at the very beginning of the church as the Holy Spirit comes. So it's a question to ask ourselves, what's God named me? What am I for? What's my purpose? And is it mine or is it God's? Or am I thinking that if I open the Bible at the right page, it will tell me what I'm for? No. We pray, we respect God, we receive Christ as Lord and we accept his Holy Spirit to be the guide and the life and the light and to rename us, repurpose us, if you like. So some conclusion. Who are you? Which covenant do you live in? And how do you know? What are the symptoms? How would you diagnose yourself? Well, I've already referred to baptism and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Are you just baptised? Or have you received the Holy Spirit to be transformed? Another diagnostic question. Do you live in fear about rules or do you live in freedom of love? The word says, well, yeah, but what does love look like? Another diagnostic, are we committed to keeping the building up or are we committed to keeping the praise alive? And back to my first question, do we, do we wash in water? Do we go back to the ceremonial or do we drink the wine? Because I think the deepest clue for us is, is in this event at Cana which is giving us this idea of a completely new relationship with the rules and ways of being that God is having with us as people. And it makes me wonder, as I read it, whether actually the real test for us is whether our new relationship with God feels like a party or feels like duty. That challenges me. I want to ask that question of myself. Is this duty is this a party? Mm. Let's leave ourselves reflecting on that question.